the, the, the people of Matebele land or those who are advocating for independence, uh, currently they don't want to call their struggle uh, secession. They want to call it a restoration. Uh, I, I, I'm just wondering uh, whether there is any conflict between a restoration and, and, and secession and whether there are any legal instruments which can be used uh, for, for restoration. Um, thank you very much for that uh, question, Babuntala. I think sometimes it becomes a matter of word choice. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of uh, you know semantics, because uh, the issue of restoration doesn't arise in literature. Legal literature does not seem to entertain or recognize that part. It is uh, mostly- We welcome all our viewers on Material and Broadcasting Corporation on the big conversations. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, Dr. Pilani Litanda Nenjolf, uh, who is going to help us to understand the situation that Matebele finds herself in. Uh, since 1980, the people of Matebele have sought to understand their social and political position in Zimbabwe. Uh, the consensus is that uh, as a people, they are discriminated against in Zimbabwe uh, and that they face existential uh, threat as a people. Uh, many ways of redressing their problems have been uh, explored. And currently the consensus is that they need self-determination. This has um, caused proposals ranging from devolution of power to outright cessation or calls for independence. Um, today we are lucky, uh, very honored to have Dr. Uh, Pilani Litanda himself on MPC's Big Conversation Program, uh, who is going to help us understand and navigate through these proposals. Uh, that is to assess their feasibility and viability, including uh, legal implications uh, of these proposals. Uh, Dr. Njovu is a Bulawa born legal academic. He's an educator and a holder of a Doctor of Law's degree. Uh, his special interest is sovereignty as an operating principle of international law and relations. Uh, today, uh, his title of his lecture is four decades as a spectator rather than a player in a game of life. What political uh, place does Matavillian hold in Zimbabwe? Uh, Dr. Njov, as I said, we welcome you on, on, on MPC. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nkala, for this opportunity. And I would like to say thank you very much to all the viewers in different parts of the world. Thank you for okay. the opportunity. All right. Um, you can uh, give us your lecture. Then if there is time at the end, I will ask one or two questions. Thank you very much. Over sir. to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, good evening, everybody in different parts of the world. Uh, as the introduction has already been given, the title of the lecture is Four Decades as a Spectator Rather Than a Player in the Game of Life. What political place does Matavilelen have in Zimbabwe? If any place, that's, I think that's how we want to begin. Uh, I, I would like to begin by sharing a quote from Thomas Hobbes, uh, one of the British uh, legal thinkers of, of the times gone by. He said, law neither makes the sovereign nor limits his authority, but it is might that makes the sovereign and the law is merely what he commands. Uh, to paraphrase it, I'll say, uh, 
for one to be a sovereign and to be bestowed with sovereign authority, it does not emanate from the law. Law is incapable of bestowing a sovereignty to anyone, but it is only one who has might, one who has power, who is able to make declarations about whatever they feel should be the order of the day. And whatever their declarations are, they are what then gets to be considered a law. So I would like us to, as, as we interact tonight, think along those lines, uh, have that in mind to say, a uh, law neither makes the sovereign nor limits the sovereign, but it is might that does so. So the structure of my lecture is as follows. Uh, I'll have an introduction where I explore material and as a state, a place, a people, and a community. I'll then go on to um, look at the anatomy of the material problem and uh, outline the analytical structure that I have adopted for the problem. And then backtrack uh, into history a little bit and look at uh, the making of a unitary Republic of Zimbabwe, how it came into being, um, all the forces that were there in the creation of Zimbabwe and all the attempts to forge a national identity and then talk about the demise of the Zimbabwean dream and then options and alternatives towards the realization of the right to self-determination, previous attempts to solve material problems, and then, of course, look at issues such as devolution, and then last but not least, talk about uh, uh, the, the right to self-determination in the form of secession. Then I'll look at the, the conceptual framework of uh, self-determination time permitting, just what are the conceptual issues, and then how international law looks at uh, uh, rather views self-determination and then i will then explore the case for the outright secession independence and fully fleshed material statehood and then explore steps towards the realization of that dream and then yeah let, let's get going now it just in summary i'm sure as, as Ms. Intala outlined every one of us fully appreciates the nature of the problem that Matavela land is facing. But uh, it's well, Matavela is a constituent part of present day Zimbabwe. And it is a place with a unique and a troubled history, uh, with a turbulent present and with an uncertain future. Well, it is a place that is multinational in the sense that it is constituted by so many demographic groups. We can name them the Abatwa, the Amandebele, the Kalanga, the Venda, the Soto the Nambia, the Tonga, the Babirwa, the Swana, the Kosa, the Shona, not in a specific uh, or preferred order. And then, of course, we know that uh, this material land used to be an independent uh, state under Lord Bengula, and it lost its sovereignty following the Anglo and the Valley War of 1894. And history reco records that material land was sovereign of course, with the power to enter into diplomatic relations, you will remember uh, the, 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 the agreements with Charles Rudd, uh, with the uh, Smith Moffat, and many others. So, when we talk about Matavela land as a state, we are not talking about a thing that never existed. It's something that is well recorded and well appreciated in history. But 137, rather 127 years later, the people find themselves in great trouble. We are talking about a, a, a people that are under siege. People who are settled with the burden just to go and make a living on a day-to-day -day basis, not even knowing how to do it. Scattered in different parts of the world in the diaspora, facing all forms of uh, vilification and hostility from their hosts and so on. Disqualified from participating as principal in the political economic space of the land of their birth. I always want to say my Tavila land is the land of my birth and the land of my death, because I don't intend to die outside of it. But uh, that turns out to be the scenario. So we can list on and on all the challenges that they are going through. Uh, but of, of importance now in the context of uh, Zimbabwe, you, you are looking at quite a number of unresolved questions 
uh, we have the question of uh, what, what some people term the national question. Uh, Professor Jonathan Moyo has spoken about it at some point. Uh, Professor Sabelo has written, ex uh, Sabelo Katendo has written extensively about the national question. Sometimes it's not well defined, but maybe what comes out very clearly is that uh, Zimbabwe as an entity doesn't seem to have imagined itself properly before it came into being. So there are challenges now in terms of what is the way forward. Uh, for instance, this is like defining who a Zimbabwean is and what a Zimbabwean is. So we basically find that uh, Zimbabweanness is being maybe defined narrowly in terms of the, the cultural and aspirational values of one group to the exclusion of all these other ones that I have uh, uh, mentioned above. So for that reason, you find that the national question stands at the center of it all, because then it explains also all that has taken place. Uh, for instance, this is like why there was and this is like uh, why the, the, the people continue to decide lines, as well as that you know, failure of governance, absolutely. So those are some of the issues. And as we have seen, because of uh, the, those challenges, recent decades particularly have seen the emergence of numerous uh, formations in much development to try and address those problems of marginalization, those problems of exclusion, uh, those problems of being displaced and expatriated into foreign lands and have your own lands taken and occupied by people from other regions. So some of the issues that have then come up, uh, there, there's been the issue of uh, the pro material political initiatives that have arisen as a result. Some calling for devolution, federalism, secession, as of course opposed to those who are still in favor of Zimbabwean unitarism. But the common thread running through the Matevele based formations is the demand for deferment of power, greater powers and competencies and functions, uh, at least to the local level of government structures. So people are demanding greater degrees of control over their own lives, over their own destiny. That's exactly, that's, that's what people are calling for because they, they realize that there are resources in their own areas of, of origin but those resources are being exploited by people who come from other regions. So that is the cause of, of the problem. Um, looking therefore at uh, the Matevele lens and the anatomy of the Matevele pro problem, you notice that it is a continuation of uh, colonization. It is a, a, a genus or a species, a type of colonization, a black on black colonization. And it is applied with the intention to conquer the people, to conquer the space, to take over natural resources, and to control the lives of the people and subject them to the dreams and the wishes of those in, in Harare. We find that, therefore, it is ironic that uh, 41 years after the dislodgement of the British uh, colonial rule, I think the people find themselves in a deeper mess than they were in 1979. Was well, at least by 1979, they were hopeful that they were engaged in a struggle which would liberate them. But now they are at a point where they don't know where to start. I would say most people don't know where to start. And the grievances are numerous. You talk about political marginalization, we've already said that the issue of systemic tribalism and the denial of the existence of tribalism by those who are perpetrating it. So basically, a Matevele person is deprived of the right to be human. You know, that humanity and humanness is actually something that they don't seem to be uh, given access to at the moment. So there are so many undercover tactics and uh, there is so much arrogance by the state uh, hiding behind the veil of sovereignty, they keep shifting goalposts, they are unwilling to be accountable, and so on and so forth. So those are the issues that the people are facing. And uh, the analytical uh, approach, as you may have already seen, 
the one that I've adopted is it's a historical element with legal analysis contextualized within what we are, what the people are experience, experiencing. Exploring the legitimacy of uh, the measures that are being proposed as well as uh, their viability, the viability of their application. So as uh, just by way of uh, verbal paragraphing, let me remind you of uh, the, the measures that have been uh, proposed. There is, some people have spoken about federalism, others have spoken about uh, self-determination uh, in the form of secession, others have spoken about devolution. So, but uh, before we can go on to assess those, maybe let's just briefly look at how uh, the Republic of Zimbabwe came into being. You find that uh, in 1890, they say it was on the 12th of, of, of September, so that's what they say, that uh, the pioneer column established itself in what we now call Harare, which then was called Solzhen when they established it. And that was four years before they came, well, maybe three years before they, they, they fought and overcame King Lopemula. And then so from that time, these two territories were, that is Mashona and Mashona land, were administered separately. But at some point, just to satisfy, you know, the, the colonial expediency, uh, they then integrated them into one. And the, 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 the unfortunate thing is that because uh, the Africans at that time were not consulted, the program was, the program was never run for their benefit. So these are some of the issues that we, we need to bear in mind because the colonial period saw the integration of Mashonaland and the Mashonaland into one colonial state. Of course, they did maintain a measure of distinction between them as, as we shall highlight uh, as we go down. And then when the, 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 the people had come to accept that there was colonization, they then started you know, different forms of resistance different forms of trying to, re to, re to, re to reverse colonization. Hence, we have now a, a semblance of oneness and unity between the Shona and the Ndebele people. We see it in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s as well, uh, uh, right up to independence in 1980. Of course, we do appreciate and understand that uh, these relations were not always smooth. For instance, you find Zabu is formed in 1962, and the following year, another party, Zanu, is formed with, with the tribal characteristics. Of course, people will deny it as much as they can. But so you, you realize that then the issue of a tribe, the tribal differences begins to show as early as 1963. And then even as we come into the 1970s, you find these efforts to, 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 to form a, a united front, but you have this Mgakao as well as the Morocco issues. Those historians have spoken extensively. Uh, I think those who have been following Denzel and Debele's uh, uh, podcasts would have come to, to, to understand all these issues about the fallout between Zipra and uh, Zanla in, during the attempts to unite. So this um, mistrust between these two groups of people continued even up to 1979, 1980. Then the demobilization process also was riddled with a lot of irregularities. And then there were outright refusals by some of the Zipra units to disband. Uh, you will have heard about how Joshua Nkomo ended up, uh, you know, disbanding some of them at Guaive with the help of some, what do they call him, Dominican and so on. So, but all those are illustrations of the fact that there was already mistrust by 1980-1981. Then coming uh, right up to 1982, when uh, Zipra is finally and fully demobilized, then we see the unleashing of Kukurahundi and so on. So you can imagine there is a scheme of things running from right from the beginning, right up to um, uh, well, let's say 1982, the arrest of uh, uh, the, the, the Zipra senior command 
look out my sugar into nuclear debate. So all those issues point to, you know, this issue of mistrust between these two regions, Machiavelli and Mashonaland. And then even after uh, people had, you know, signed the unity agreement and tried to work together, you find that the distrust and the mistrust did not uh, completely disappear. Well, we come maybe I'll just fast forward to 1999 with the formation of the MDC and the excitement across the board. Everybody thinking, oh, now we have a common goal, a common purpose. We are going to work together now as Zimbabweans. So I think during that period, almost everybody was willing to, em to embrace the Zimbabwean uh, tag and, uh, and, and identity. But again, as things progress around 2005, you have a split. And if you look closely at it, it does still exhibit those tribal, uh, what you call, uh, elements. So it, it is really a sign that uh, uh, the, the, the issue of mistrust between the two groups has persisted. And of course, talking about the demise of, of, of the Zimbabwean dream, um, you find that by 1983, when Kukura is fully unleashed on the people, under the pretext that they are looking for dissidents, uh, that's when everybody else in Matavilla began to question whether really being Zimbabwean was anything that was, was, that was worth their effort and their time. Because surely those who experienced and were exposed to Kukura on the details, that is those, those, those were soldiers that came from village to village. Some of them were very clear telling people to go back to South Africa and you would wonder, going back to South Africa, I've never been there in the first place. So, but those are the kind of, uh, uh, what's called accounts that people give of how they were being pushed, how they were being openly told that they were not citizens, that they were foreigners, that they belonged to some other place. And so, as then you, you, you fast, fast forward and see how even after the unity accord, which I, I, I would like to call a surrender document or a surrender agreement by ZAPU, because it was nothing other than that. You can't imagine somebody signing a unity agreement when his a territory, his household is under military siege. So I would call it a, 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 a surrender by, by ZAPU and maybe a convenient way of stopping conflict and saving the lives for being completely annihilated. But now, as I was going to say, even after that, you, you get to realize that the unity is not what everybody else is thinking about. So as I would like to echo what Professor Sabelo says at some point, that uh, Zimbabwe, if at all it was born, it, was died, it died rather in 1983, because then that's when people began to question their Zimbabweanness. So now, in the light of all that, <clears throat> the question is, what options and alternatives do we have towards the realization of uh, the right uh, to self-determination? By self-determination, uh, I, I would take it as you know, a slippery slope ranging from federalism as a way of bringing power closer to the people talking about devolution as a way of bringing power to the people, or self-determination in the form of secession and independence, full independence. So I'm saying it's a slippery slope because there are people who are willing to accommodate the concept of Zimbabwe as a unitary state, but within the concept of federalism. And then there are those who are saying, no, this is a phase thing. Why should we keep trying to resuscitate something that has failed us so much? So that turns out to be the, 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 the slippery slope. And of course, you will notice that there have been previous attempts by the people, especially the Matebele people, to have peace. I would say the Matebele lost a lot when Zapu was disbanded. Those who were mature at that time would have seen the pain that staunch Zapu members felt. For the first time, they had to answer to the name Zanu something that they had never imagined the whole of their life. 
So that was a serious loss for the people of Macedonia. But then they were able and willing to compromise that if and hoping that it would bring peace and an end to the conflict. But regrettably, regrettably uh, it was taken differently by those who had actually pushed for, 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 for it in the first place. So as, as a result, you find that uh, even though it was signed and concluded, there have not been any tangible benefits for the people of Matvelele. So of course, there have been many other internal measures, as I also mentioned the formation of the movement for democratic change. Uh, people were, for the first time, I think, they were willing to abandon uh, what one would call parochial tribal or ethnic identities and come together under one banner. A lot of people for the first time voted maybe somebody who was of uh, a Shona uh, origin that was Mokem Shangirai, because people believed that he meant well and they were willing to work with him. But as things turned out later on, there was no sincerity. <clears throat> in all that was taking place. Uh, some people may say maybe this is anecdotal, but uh, talking now about how eventually we have Emma Coupe sidelined and her replacement, all those are controversial indicators of a, a subterranean or an undercurrent of trying to keep uh, some people at the top and others at the bottom. So it, it turns out to be an unwritten rule. And that unwritten rule, therefore, it causes a lot of, you know, problems in, in the process. So we find that as a result, the people still continue not to, to, to enjoy what they hope to enjoy. Uh, then having, having realized that maybe uh, that was not going to work, in the run up to the 2013 constitution, people pushed for federalism. Some agitated for it, others went on to uh, you know, promote it in different ways. And so they a campaign for devolution and devolution of power was eventually adopted, but as we shall look uh, at it later on, there were issues also around how it was integrated into the constitution. Suffice to say that uh, <clears throat> this quest for formative and uh, uh, self-determination through federalism assumes that if it is granted, if it were granted hypothetically, then it would bring power to the village, power to the to the district, power to as much as, as closer as possible to the people. <clears throat> but as I have already said. Uh, the, the constitution number 20 of 2013 still insists that Zimbabwe is a unitary state. <clears throat> Excuse me. It does not want to entertain the idea of a federalism. And uh, you, you will notice, as I have said elsewhere, that uh, you see, federalism cannot work except where people acknowledge that there is diversity. Because if there is, uh, uh, there is no acknowledgement of diversity, if people continue to pretend that everybody is the same, if we go on to criminalize things like ethnic and tribal identity, or some, for instance, <clears throat> if somebody says I'm Kalanga and we think then there's something wrong with it. If somebody says I'm Debele or I'm, I'm Tonga or I'm Benda, then you say, no, 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 you are not. Rather, you are a Zimbabwean first and foremost. I think without noticing it, there's been a criminalization of identity. And then the question is, why is it so important that people should not identify themselves and take pride in their histories and in their nationality? So that becomes then a sticking point. As a result, you find that the issue of uh, federalized, federalism it cannot be and will not be adopted from the light of the things. Of course, we have spoken about, uh, maybe let me just give a, a little more time to the viability of devolution in terms of the constitution. We have some of our friends and 
your relatives, well-meaning people, who insist that uh, maybe devolution of power should be given a chance. They are saying that uh, since the, the clause on devolution of power has been adopted in the constitution, it is a sign that government for the, for the last time, at, fine, at last one would say, is willing to now meet the people of Matabelel and, and uh, consider giving uh, a seat in some of the power uh, to the local communities. But you find that the devolution provision suffers from many congenital structural weaknesses. Let us look at what it says. That is uh, section 264 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe. That is amendment number 20 of, 20, of 2013. It says, whenever appropriate, I'd like us to underline that part. Whenever appropriate, government powers and responsibilities must be devolved to provincial and metropolitan councils and local authorities, which are competent to carry out those responsibilities efficiently and effectively. Now, I, I ask you to, to underline the part which says, whenever appropriate, because that's the one that I would like us to pay attention to. It says, uh, because you see, a constitutional provision which states that an act must be done if it is appropriate is meaningless unless it defines the, the criteria to determine appropriateness. In, in the first place, if somebody says, whenever appropriate, what do we mean by appropriate? Who determines whether it's appropriate or not appropriate? And what yardstick or what criteria, what checklist do they use to establish whether it is appropriate or not appropriate? So we find that in the absence of uh, all those issues, um, it becomes then a problem to, 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 to even expect an implementation because all, you cannot bring anybody to account. You cannot question anybody. You cannot drag anybody to court and say that they are not doing, uh, they are not uh, bringing the devolution as, as promised in the constitution. Because in the first place, the constitution doesn't state who the functionary is. Who is responsible for that? So if you are going to try and litigate for that, who will you cite as, 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 as the respondent in that kind of a, a, a suit? That becomes the first state. And the next issue is, if you are going to, suppose you identify whoever you bring before the court, the next point then will be to show that it was appropriate and this particular person refused to devolve. And the tricky part then is, we are talking here about discretion because appropriateness is a matter of discretion. And there's no one person who can substitute their own discretion in the place of other people's discretion. So if you bring somebody in and say, okay, it is appropriate that you bring devolution to my village. And he says, no, it is not appropriate. It is his discretion against your discretion. So then at the end of the day, what carries the day? Which, whose point of view will carry the day? So those are issues that people need to be paying attention to. <clears throat> Hence, I'm saying that without a checklist, without outlining the circumstances or the conditions necessary to determine that appropriateness, this, this remains an, an, an impossible. It remains aspirational. <clears throat> and this kind of a provision cannot be enforced it cannot be carried out. And uh, it is not surprising because remember, this clause was put in, was adopted grudgingly in order to appease maybe a people that were pushing hard for it. They said, okay, let's just put it there and uh, not put enough uh, uh, provisions to go with it to enable anybody to be able to push forward and have it implemented. So anybody who is waiting on uh, this devolution, hoping that this is the solution for, for, for Matabele and, and, and all its problems, I would hasten to say it is a weight that shall not 
come to anything, it shall not bring anything, because there is just no way. That's why that thing will remain inside the covers of the constitutional document and not be taken out and not be implemented, because there's no way to implement it. There's not even a way to enforce its implementation. So to hope that one day it will, is just to, to, to hope on nothing. It's a hope against hope, if one could say. So then, <clears throat> with that, uh, we, we, I would then like us to look at uh, this quest for determination, self-determination. Um, <clears throat> I just alluded to the fact that uh, the, I, would, I would call federalism is a form of self-determination. Self but of course, on the, uh, on the other uh, spectrum, end of the spectrum, then you would have devolution if also accepted. It would at least allow people the choice and the right to, 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 to run some of uh, their programs with very little interference. <clears throat> and then at most, self-determination would be in the form of secession, where we are saying a full independence, full statehood, if a member of the international community, a sovereign state, where we, we, we have a Bulawayo or some other nominated center as, as, as a seat of power, where we have our parliaments, where we have everything there for people to, to, to you know, the, the, the kind of authority that is bestowed upon a, a sovereign. Uh, and of course, I have said that uh, the constitution in section one says that Zimbabwe is a unitary state. Maybe one thing I, I, I just overlooked when I was talking about the devolution clause, if I can go back there a little and, and, and bring out something. It says, uh, well, it doesn't, okay, no, it's not there. But uh, the point anyway is that devolution is ad was adopted in order to prevent secession. And the word secession is there in the constitution of Zimbabwe to say they want to stop or to prevent the session. Now, you ask yourself one question. Why would a constitution of a country, of a state, uh, legislate itself in such a way as to prevent secession? Secession by who? Who had ever uh, proposed it? So in other words, it was a preemptive clause it is a clause put in place in order to forestall what they think might be a problem. So in, in actual fact, they are trying to criminalize cessation so that anybody who is heard talking about it, they want to go back and say, hey, can you check the constitution? It says you cannot secede because Zimbabwe is a unitary state. Now, that, that the, the issue of unitarism is adopted without explanation adopted without consultation. It is, it is a hypocritical honor and respect for colonial boundaries. It, the very people who have been so vocal about how bad and how evil colonialism was, all of a sudden they are clinging only to the state that colonialism I mean, created. That hypocrisy of the highest order, because really, if colonialism was bad, and everything that it produced must have been bad. There's no way you can pick, cherry pick what is nice for you and pick out what you think is not nice for you. That kind of hypocrisy should really not be tolerated. So they say they were fighting against colonialism, but they have inaugurated a state that colonizes. Because by saying that, uh, this Zimbabwe is a unitary state, and then people should not secede, and so on and so forth. Uh, knowing very well that uh, elections in Zimbabwe and elections in Africa, particularly, tend out tend to be nothing other than a, 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 what you call this a census. It's an ethnic census. So going to count out which ethnic group that constitutes that state has more people because voting in Africa has tended to be on tribal or ethnic lines. Uh, I, I remember what uh, 
Professor Patrick Lumumba was saying at some point about the issue of how uh, the ethnic group with the largest number of people turned out to be uh, the winner of every flip side. So then as a result, you find elections are meaningless. And that being the case, they, somebody then goes on to try and entrench majoritarian dictatorship by saying, you may not succeed. You may not even talk about it because this is a unitary state. But we just maybe like I said at the beginning, we are discussing this against the backdrop of uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes' statement, which says, a law does not create so a sovereign. It doesn't limit the sovereign. It is might that does so. So I think in all this, let, uh, let us have that lingering at the back of our, our memories so that we don't always uh, lose track of what we are talking about. So, but uh, maybe the long and the short of it is that uh, the principle of devolution of power is not going to work. Uh, therefore, uh, the mention of the, con the concept of secession in a national constitution without elaborating raises human rights questions. These are the very issues that I would like us to, to, to as I have already alluded to, uh, have in mind as we discuss. Now, having said all this, we now come to the conceptual framework for self-determination. Um, it is a, a very interesting concept that has not been properly defined, or rather has not been elusively defined clearly defined. There are so many uh, references in international legal instruments to the right to self-determination. The United Nations Charter mentions it in Article 1.2. And then <clears throat> even the, 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 the United, General, United Nations General Assembly um, resolution 1514, a Roman numerals 15 of 1960. It, it talks about uh, the need for the decolonization and to allow people to uh, pursue uh, their individual uh, liberties and freedoms. But there is a Nigerian uh, scholar called Oro Okoronko who has written about uh, the, 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 the Biafra secessionist movement and uh, he says that self-determination has been construed as the right of people to determine their own destiny, to, for, to, 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 to uh, their own destiny and form of government. For example, self-determination can be based on a people's desire to be free from colonial rule. Self-determination may be exercised among other things through the establishment of a sovereign independent state by integration or association with another state. The exact meaning of self-determination, of course, is enmeshed in controversy. But as you can see, secession refers to political dissolution where political actors withdraw their expectations and involvement in, in one country or in one state, and then they give their allegiance where they, wherever they want to be. So, and, and you see talking about sovereignty of individuals, they, they should be, able to withdraw the, their allegiance from one authority and bestow the allegiance on another authority. That should be a, a, a principle, especially uh, to, taking into account that the people of Matavilland are such a recognizable uh, entity internationally and globally. Everybody knows them. Anybody who pretends not to know uh, the Matavilland people is actually lying through their teeth. Because as you, as you will well know, especially the United Kingdom, it is recorded that uh, Lopengula, King Lopengula and his, his armies caused a, a great, you know, great, they, they had great resistance against British. They even wiped out the Alan Wilson patrol all those are facts that are recorded. So nobody can pretend that they don't know who they are. So you find that self-determination therefore is the right of every people to choose uh, the sovereign under which they want to live, 
to be free from alien masters and not to be handed over from sovereign to sovereign. I'd like us to take note of this, not to be handed over from sovereign to sovereign. At the end of, of British colonization in 1979, 1980, it was like the Mdevele or the people of Land. let me desist from using that way, the people of Land were handed over from a British sovereign and then to a Harare sovereign. Uh, they were parceled out as if they were commodities. Those are issues that we, we really need to take note of. In fact, it's, 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 Oro Congo says that they should not be handed over from sovereign to sovereign as if they were property, because it is only property that is handed over. And then Oro Congo goes on to highlight the link between the perception of self-determination and popular sovereignty. As I have already highlighted, popular sovereignty is different from uh, the prevailing or the, the, this other form of sovereignty, which is sometimes called the, the Westphalian principle of sovereignty, whereby you find that it is the monarch or the king or elected president, whoever they are, who are said to be bearers of sovereignty, when in actual fact, it is the people who are bearers of the sovereignty. Then they lend it to those authorities to exercise the sovereignty on their behalf. And because the people are the sovereign, therefore it goes without saying that the people can withdraw their sovereignty whenever they want. And then they can give it to the authority whom they think represents their interests. So it, it, it is really not true to say that uh, self-determination should not be, uh, it rather should be a crime. It is not a crime. And then, so looking at it, Oro Congo goes on to identify five key, key and self explanatory elements to self determination. He says that issue to government according to the people, absence of uh, internal and external domination, and then free pursuit of economic, social, and cultural development, and the deployment of uh, rather the enjoyment of fundamental human rights and the absence of discrimination on the grounds of race, color, or political conviction. Now you'll find that the people of Matavilla do not enjoy any of those five uh, items there according to Oro Congo. So without contradiction, you find that uh, they, they, they then continue to be not denied of all those. And uh, just to conclude on this section, self-determination is an inalienable human right recognized in the civilized world. You remember in 2014, the Scottish referendum, it was, you know, the people of Scotland were given the freedom to express whether they still want to be part of the United Kingdom or not. So when they decided, no, they wanted to be, it ended that way. So in other words, people should always be given the freedom in any part of the world to decide and determine where they want to give their own allegiance. Now, having said that, let's turn then over to the international law position on self-determination, secession, and independence. Um, there are two principles here that are in conflict. You have the, con the principle of self-determination, which is a right, as I have said, in an inalienable right of that the people have. And then you have the principle that uh, seeks to uphold the territorial integrity of state with the intention of maintaining the global order. So what you then have is that Article 1.2 of the United Nations Charter is the one on self-determination. And Article 2.4 seeks to protect territorial integrity of state in order to, 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 to maintain the stability. So that's why the Security Council, United Nations Security Council uh, tends to get, in, to get involved in all cases where uh, there are issues of maybe conflict around the methods of secession and so on. So you find that because in terms of Article 1.2, communities have the right to pursue their destinies, including the right to choose the systems of government and sovereign authority to which they want to, 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 to you know, lend their, their loyalty. 
And then, of course, we also have earlier, or rather later, rather not earlier, the, I've referred to the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 1514 of 1960, which also recognizes that right to self-determination, uh, uh, saying that people should be free from foreign rule. So international law balances these two. Uh, that's why you find that in the case of Kosovo, for instance, when Kosovo declared independence in 2008, some states, more than 90 states, went on to recognize Kosovo as a sovereign state. Of course, there were others who were saying, no, this is too hasty and, and so on and so forth. But in 2010, the German Court of International Justice went on to give a, an opinion on Kosovo to say that uh, <clears throat> there was nothing wrong with Kosovo to deploy it, I mean, declaring itself a sovereign if it met all the, the necessary conditions. So, but of course, as you would see, there, there's a mixed reaction with Crimea and so on and so forth. And uh, of course, closer to home, you find that in 2011, Sudan, after almost 30 years of conflict, which had cost the life of John Garang, the, the real leader, eventually got independent as, as, as Southern Sudan, which then indicates and illustrates that the, 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 the international law does not prohibit secession. Um, where all the necessary conditions are met, secession is perfect and secession gets carried out. So then it, it becomes a matter not of law, but a matter of might. That's what uh, the region of Biafra in Nigeria, southern Nigeria, experienced in 1967. You will have read uh, about the, the three-year Biafra war from 1967 to 1970, where, you know, Biafra became a de facto state until the rest of Nigerian states uh, regrouped and then um, overcame Biafra and drew it back in, into the Nigerian Confederation. So then that the issue of Biafra illustrates that it wasn't really uh, 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 that the, 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 there was no, it was illegal, but rather it was because there was no might. Biafra did not have the might to sustain its own sovereignty and independence. That's what happened. So we've got all these examples in Africa, of course, having had Eritrea becoming an independent state, from Ethiopia in 1991 and so on, which then means that uh, this uh, 1964 OAU principle uh, on, on borders, they call it AHG Resolution 16 on borders and border disputes. Uh, it, it, is, it has been overtaken by events because Kwame Nkrumah and others wanted to sustain and maintain the, the integrity of uh, what they call the sanctity of, of the colonial uh, boundaries. And invoking this principle of uh, iti positivis juris that was first applied uh, in uh, regarding the Latin states in, in South America. So the OAU had uh, adopted it. It was applied in the, is it the Mali, Burkina Faso, then Upper Volta a dispute as well as uh, the Western Sahara uh, uh, case where they applied this uh, principle of positivities, which just says, as you posit. So in other words, they were trying to uphold the, the boundaries as they were created uh, during the colon colonial period. And of course, you know, as I have said, that whilst the law doesn't prohibit it, its application becomes quite problematic. In Senegal, since 1982, the Tasman's region has been trying to pull away from the rest of Senegal, but without success. And there are many other uh, minority groups uh, all over Africa and everywhere else. But talking about Africa, of course, you would talk about Ambazonia in Cameroon, 
you will talk about Barotse land in Zambia and so on and so forth. Now, we then come to, 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 to the item on the case for outright secession. I think we, we I, I have canvassed a lot about why Matevele land really has a, a, a point in seeking secession. Maybe just to highlight that uh, secession should not be uh, peddled as a, a goal which seeks maybe to vilify a certain ethnic group. It should not sound like it's a hate. Um, in other words, while people may pursue the secession or uh, the self determination of Machiavelli, I think the, the language maybe that dashes the Shona people is actually not appropriate because Machiavelli land is seeking secession not because of the hatred of the Shona. I have highlighted the fact that it has always been a state before it was even bungled with Mashona. So the people of Mashona land are not the reason. Hatred for them is not the reason. But the issue is people want to pursue an independent destiny. It is their right to do so according to their own choices. Because you see, if, if it comes out, if it comes across as a, a hate propaganda or rather a hate a program, then the world will look suspiciously. Because for obvious reasons, politics of identity is impugned all over the world. People are very suspicious. It was the politics of identity that saw uh, the program against 6 million Jews uh, by the Nazi and Adolf Hitler. It was the politics of identity that saw the, the killing of a million uh, people in Rwanda in the, in the mid 1990s. So it's therefore the, the, the discussion of material cessation should never ever be seen as if it were a, a mobilization against the Shona group. Because if, if that happens, then that would be a very serious mistake. You can't even convince anybody anywhere in the world if you carry that kind of, of, of a rhetoric. So that's one area where I, I think people will have to be a little careful. Of course, the reasons, as I have said, they have been highlighted above. It is the, the, the it's Zimbabwe being a failed state. Uh, of course, maybe first and foremost, Matevele land having existed as an independent state until 1894, and then Zimbabwe being a failed state, having failed to achieve this goal of nation building with so many disparities in the development of Matevele land and Mashona land, and then the issue of depriving the Matevele people of economic power through selective granting of business licenses, you know, arbitrary exercise of uh, uh, power, administrative power to the exclusion, and so on and so forth. And uh, maybe just to highlight also the issue of a persistent denial of rights to the people of Matevele land. As a Mkululinyati and a, another uh, uh, a friend of his, I'll call him that, wrote a certain paper uh, about how the, the law was re, uh, amended in the 1980s to, 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 to foreclose any prosecutions that people may have wanted to raise against the, the Kukuraundi or 50 brigade personnel. So that on its own is a denial of justice to people who believe they were wrong. So in, in other words, the state is refusing to protect the people. Now, if the state does not protect the people, then who do the people look up to? So then for that reason, you find it is justifiable for these subjoining territories of Matevele and Mashona land joined together uh, in, in, due to the accident of history and time without consultation on the people themselves. So it makes sense, therefore, that uh, they should be, be uh, unbungled so that they can pursue independent destinies. And I believe if they do, uh, they will both do well. Was well, at the moment, there is a lot of negative energy. In fact, for the past 40 years, Zimbabwe has been dominated by negative energy. Nobody wants or nobody pursues anything productive. It looks like it's a game of football where you are marking your enemy and preventing him from scoring. 
without going ahead to score any goal yourself. That is precisely what is happening. So because of that, I think it is much better and it would liberate the people of Zimbabwe themselves if this whole uh, marriage of convenience is dissolved because surely there are signs that it is irretrievably broken down. Let it be dissolved so that then each one of the parties may pursue their own independent destiny and start living their lives freely of the fears and the tensions of what might happen if the other one gets to power and they don't get to power and so on and so forth. And because Zimbabwe has always put on a very bad test, test us, uh, being an accident, as I have said, uh, I think, therefore, uh, dissolution of, of that institution and then having two successor states each running its own affairs would be in perfect order. That then, uh, of course, answers uh, the question that I began with to say, is there a place for Machiavelli in Zimbabwe? From my own analysis, there is no place. I'm not sure other, how others would perceive it, but the circumstances and the weight of evidence indicates clearly that uh, there is no place. So then if there is no place, what is the way forward? What steps should be adopted? Uh, as I have said, uh, I, I highlighted what is lacking, what is not there. I think then, the people of Machiavelli land and Marshall land uh, should be allowed to pursue their destinies. So then the question is, maybe just to round it up, does Machiavelli land as an entity or as a, a region satisfy the criteria set in 1933 in terms of the Montevideo Convention in Latin America, where it was stated that uh, the state for any territory to become a state recognized internationally in law, it should have a permanent population, a defined territory, a government, and capacity to enter into relations with other states. But the issue of population, yes, there is a population, even though it is in the diaspora in the far flung places, having been pushed and forced, but there is a, a permanent population for Matavele land. And then, as for the issue of a defined territory, again, there is a defined territory. Everybody knows where they've come from. Remember, if people are having to decide, that would be on the basis of a referendum. Each person would base uh, vote on the basis of where their home is. So the territory is there, the territory is defined. Then the issue of government. Yes, people are there. They are enough human resources. From to, to bring together a government. And uh, people have already shown the ability to govern in their different respective villages, uh, ward, cells, districts. So that, that's where government takes place. It takes place in the village, where you have Induna, where you have Usapugu, where you have the village head, where you have Umdisa, whoever is there within the village, that is leadership. So the, the capacity to govern, yes, it is there in Matebele. And then the capacity to enter into diplomatic relations. Again, that capacity is there to enter into diplomatic relations. Of course, we know that before uh, the illegal overthrow of the Matebele uh, kingdom in 19, uh, sorry, in 1893, uh, Matebele land already was capable of entering into uh, what you call diplomatic relations with other states. So those issues are second. So then what is the next step? It's mobilization of people, the masses, getting people to understand what their destiny is, what they stand to gain. You see, people in Matavel have been confused, I would say, because we have some that are straddled between two opinions. Uh, there is the opinion of wanting to stay in Zimbabwe, in spite of, you know, all these glaring 
acts of marginalization, exclusion, and so on. There are people who are hopeful that maybe they will find a magic formula to work it out. I wonder how. And then, of course, we have those who are hoping that maybe one day uh, the people in, in Zimbabwe that's in my journal and are going to change their mind and vote for somebody for my journal, my journal and, and then have that as business as usual. I always say to myself, if people could not vote for Dr. Joshua Mkabugongom, whom they all honor and respect as Father Zimbabwe, but they still couldn't bring him into power, then one wonders who else they'll be willing to bring into power. Because surely his credentials speak for themselves. They are all agreed that he was the father of Zimbabwe, that he's the man who initiated and ran the struggle. But when it mattered most, he was sidelined. He even flew and fled into exile, running away from the people that he had liberated. So now, if we are going to think, hope that one day things will change, and then these people will start liking somebody else, I think it amounts to living in a fool's paradise. So I think, in a way, people should begin to coalesce around principles of how to move forward instead of struggling between two opinions. Make up your mind. Because as long as the collective of materialism doesn't make up its mind, then you continue to do two steps backward, one, two steps forward, one step backward. Or rather, one step forward, two steps backward. That becomes a kind of a clumsy arrangement. So there should be a massive lobby at national, that is within Matavellan itself, of course, by Matavellan, I mean it's diaspora, it's still part of Matavellan. And then the lobbying at the international community, and then push and agitate for a referendum, demand a referendum from the government of Zimbabwe, and then have people vote in that referendum. People sometimes ask who's going to be eligible. You know, there is a, a miracle that uh, Smith, uh, whether it's Smith or it's those before him, that they bequeathed unto the people of Matavela and Mashonale. And that is the magical ID number. The last digit always loops everyone back to their village of origin. So really, as to who should be eligible to vote, that should not be a problem. Because whatever the last two digits of your ID are, they determine where your home is. That's the place where you should go and vote, whether you want to stay or you want an exit. So I, I think those are some of the modalities to, 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 to look at. Then also consider approaching international courts like the African Courts on Human Rights, as well as uh, the Permanent Court for International Justice. But I think these are areas where a little bit of uh, research needs to be undertaken uh, to, to establish exactly uh, the capacity or the standing that uh, the people of Matavilla would have. Because for instance, the Permanent Court of International Justice entertains issues or cases or matters between states. Uh, individuals have no standing. So how then would we establish a standing in order to bring that matter up? Those are issues to be investigated. And uh, also issues of uh, the jurisdiction, well, maybe it would have, but uh, those are issues to be thoroughly threshed out before the action can be taken. Of course, think also about how to rope in the United Nations Security Council and the General Assembly so that they begin to take this matter seriously and they begin to put it on their agenda because people need to communicate clearly that they have a point and they want this thing realized. So just in conclusion, I would say that having explored the unique challenges facing material and then having canvassed the various, po various points of view on its fate, it is clear that Zimbabwe and material are facing different challenges. Zimbabwe is facing a democratic or a democratization process, but Matavilleland is facing an independence or lack of independence crisis. So to sit in Gwanda or sit in Blamki or sit in Lupane and hope 
that a democratic process will help you. It is actually expecting too much from that process. Uh, because unless you are liberated, then you cannot begin to talk about a democratic process. Because a colonialist never issues or uh, gives the rights of democracy, uh, I mean, democratic rights to the colonized. Smith never gave democratic rights to the colonized. It was only after the dislodgement of, 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 of colonization that people began to speak of, uh, you know, the, 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 the democratic rights and so on. So the declaring reality, in short, is that the Matabele does not have a place in Zimbabwe. That is the way in which people should look at it. And then, of course, just to close, I'll say again, Hope is saying, law neither makes the sovereign nor limits his authority. It is might that makes the sovereign, and law is merely what he commands. And then another interesting, maybe, statement to augment that is by John Austin, who described law as the commands of the sovereign. This therefore means that without sovereignty, you can never have a law that runs in favor of your interests. Thank you very much, Mr. Gala, for hosting me tonight. Uh, thanks, thanks very, very much, uh, Dr. Love. Uh, I, I hope uh, what you have shared with us today will actually help the people of Matabeleland to map their way forward. Uh, I've got uh, just a few questions um, which I've been writing down as you were giving us your lecture. Um, first, the, the, the people of Matebele land or those who are advocating for independence, uh, currently they don't want to call their struggle uh, secession. They want to call it a restoration. Uh, I, I, I'm just wondering, uh, whether there is any conflict between a restoration and, and, and secession, and whether there are any legal instruments which can be used uh, for, for restoration. Um, thank you very much for that uh, question, Babunkala. I think sometimes it becomes a matter of word choice. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of uh, you know semantics, because uh, the issue of restoration doesn't arise in literature. Legal literature does not seem to entertain or recognize that part. It is mostly because, like I, I, I say, referring to the, the you know the, the, the some of the, the the writings and so on. It is whatever, whatever you call it, the result is that you are seceding because you are pulling away from what is recognized as an international legal entity. So what you call it will not turn it into anything that it is not. Um, but maybe the reason we, 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 we tend, people tend to use the word restoration it is to illustrate that uh, because this state existed before, mm -hmm. now it is being restored. So that, that somehow it gives it, uh, maybe it, it, it enhances the argument and, and makes it sound like you are not creating ent anything entirely new, but you are bringing in, or rather you are restoring something that has already existed before. So, so, so as a way, as an instrument of persuasion and as a, an instrument of making public relations and to justify and clarify to the world why this is happening, the wealth restoration would be fine. But at the end of the day, when the law is looking at it, there is no uh, reference to, to, to restoration, the legal instruments like, for instance, the constitution of Zimbabwe did not say anything about restoration. But I guess if one had to bring the matter before the court, 
that thing will be deliberated as a matter of cessation rather than restoration. Okay. So, so, so as a as a term of law, there, there wouldn't be restoration to talk about. Okay, yeah, I think that, that that's what I I, I was thinking. Um, as 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 you outlined before, uh, you say cessation under international law um, is permissible. Uh, yes, however, cessation with an element of irritant is is not. Yes. Well, yeah. you see, the issue maybe here is that, uh, as especially looking at Africa and the nature of how of the colonial boundaries and how they were created, there is the concern that irritantism if allowed to prevail. For instance, if you look at the, the borderline between uh, Zimbabwe and, uh, say, Botswana, you have the Botswana this side, or the Botswana this side, the Botswana that side, you have the Kalanga this side and the Kalanga that side. Mm -hmm. So if now it is going to be an issue of irritantism, it means that it will not affect one territory. It is now going to spill over into you know affecting so many other uh, you know groups because now you, you end up with the issue of the Tonga the, in the Zambezi the Tonga is this side and the Tonga that side and how about the vendor by the, the Limpopo so that would end up creating a lot of, of, of a lot of challenges that's why when these two get combined co co combined then it becomes a recipe for, for, for chaos. Yeah. Um, one more question. Um, you spoke about displacements. Yes, sir. And yes. linking them to statelessness. Yes. So that has been a phenomenon in Machiavelli. Certainly, uh, it began as early as 19, 1982, mm -hmm. when people were threatened by CIO and the operatives. They then began to flee into Botswana, into South Africa. And uh, so people were sneaking into those uh, territories just to seek refuge there. And of course, taking uh, uh, advantage of linguistic camouflage, some of them were even able to attain nationality in those in the host countries. But uh, when the issue of you know, displacement was, um, I would say, fast tracked, because that's the word in Zimbabwe. When it was fast tracked after 2000, you find mm -hmm. that uh, people went out in large numbers and they are no longer able to get. Uh, nationalized or naturalized in the host countries where they stay. Mm -hmm. So we, we, if, for instance, here in Johannesburg, if you walk into places like uh, Hilbro, Beria, places like uh, Uvel and so on, Jubert Park there by, by Johannesburg, you have young men and young women, maybe of about ages 20 to 25, who have given birth to their own children. Those young men and women don't have documents themselves, which means their children also cannot obtain them. Mm -hmm. so as a result, those young men and young men can, women cannot even get jobs, let alone yes. take their children to school, because a child can't go to school without a birth certificate. So this is the nature of the statelessness that the people are facing. Not only, of course, in South Africa, I've just given that as an example, but it's all over the world where they are not fully integrated. Mm -hmm. All right. No, um, my, my, my last question uh, is about uh, the materialism problem, uh, which you said um, is all about colonization. Uh, which means uh, it was colonized by uh, the British. Then after that, British as the sovereign, it passed uh, 
that sovereignty to Mashona land, who continues to colonize uh, Matebele land. So basically, the decolonization uh, wasn't done properly. Would you say that? Very much so. Um, you see, somehow, maybe in, in, in 1980, the politicians in Matebele land, one reason or another, uh, they, they sunk into a slumber and did not realize what was taking place. But I think uh, it was the leadership without really pointing a, a finger at anyone specific. Remember, uh, we, we do not point fingers at elders in our community. <laughs> our yes. fathers are held with respect, even if they have erred at some point. I think there were intelligent, intelligence uh, reports that were ignored. If we, out of uh, maybe lack of foresight or maybe being over trusting, because you see the refusal by the, the young men and the young women at Kwai uh, there, the, 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 the Zupra units who were refusing to disband, they were based on intelligence reports and information that there was an error in this transition. So because of that, you find that one group already had an idea about what they were going to do. And the other group was caught napping. That's why you find that no, no sooner was the demobilization completed than did we have the, the entry now of armed men into the villages, hunting down the very people who had sacrifice their life to bring that independence to you. So if there had been proper exercise of foresight, really, uh, they, they should have been a demand there at Lancaster House that as we disband, as, we, as, we, as you guys give us power, you must split it so that we get it the way you guys found it. That would have averted a lot of problems. So then you find that material and was handed over as a trophy to, to Mashona to continue a kind of a native colonization on the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, now I hope we will have another time in the future to discuss these issues in greater detail. Uh, otherwise, thanks very much for your time today. If you have any closing remarks, uh, that would be nice. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nkala, and your viewers for this opportunity. Like you said, uh, these are issues that we need to continually engage on. Because, you know, as the Bible says, iron sharpens iron, therefore every man count, uh, sharpens the countenance of his brother. So as people continually engage on these, it, it helps us to forge a way forward. First of all, it helps us to diagnose our problems and where we are coming from, and then begin to even map out a way forward. So it will always be very important for us to, you know, have these kind of conversations. Thank you very much, Mr. Nkala and the MPC for the opportunity. Okay, no, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Ngaf. Siabonga, Abala Lelebe MPC, Ikama Mutulani Nkala. Namshanje was not Dr. Jove, a Siabonga Kulu or Loazi, a Strobe Lelona, the attempt to lose a season paga to a gate, Siabonga Kuru. 